Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Anuj Chavla and today I'm going to talk about Halux valgus. So I think all of you must be aware what is Halux valgus. So this is an outward deviation of the phalanx in comparison to the metatarsal uh, of the first ray. So or in other words on layman terms it is also called as bunion. So Halux valgus is the commonest four foot deformity uh, which you would see, almost every one of you would see in your day-to-day -day practice. Many of them would not be symptomatic, but many of them are really bothered by it and they need to get something done for that. So it is not just the hallux valgus, it's not just the outer deviation of the thumb in comparison to the first metatarsal, but uh, it also involves the lesser toes as well. And if you look at the, di uh, the deformity, it is not just a deformity in one plane. It involves all the three dimensions. As per a study done by uh, McCoughlin, the incidence of hallux valgus uh, for it to be bilateral is in more than 80% of the cases. So actually, what are the things that predispose a patient or a person to a hallux valgus? Well, I think there are intrinsic factors present and there are certain extrinsic factors. So if we talk about the extrinsic factor, something which is definitely modifiable, the only extrinsic factor is wearing a narrow toed shoes. So there is enough evidence to say that someone who is wearing a shoe which is narrow at the forefoot region or what we call as a shoe with a narrow toe box is more prone to have hallux valgus. Unfortunately, this is the most common uh, format of all the designer shoes that ladies wear. Well, talking about the intrinsic factors which are actually not modifiable, well, there are lots and lots of them, but most common, of, most common is uh, female sex and those who have a genetic uh, tendency. So a family history of flat foot is, uh, sorry, a family history of hallux valgus is a significant predisposing factor uh, for causing bunion in the next family as well. So other than that, there are certain other factors. So metatarsus primus verus, which means an increase in the intermetatarsal angle or the angle between the first and the second metatarsal. So that is present in many children and that itself is a predisposing factor to have hallux valgus deformity. Well, a lot of connective tissue disorders and hyperlaxity syndrome, Marfan syndrome, Down syndrome, EDS, so all these also predispose a patient or a person to have hallux valgus. Inflammatory arthropathies, specifically rheumatoid arthritis, gout, psoriatic arthropathies occasionally can also predispose an individual to have the hallux valgus deformity. Well, pest planus is another major factor. So all those patients who have flexible pest planus or even in adults, the adult acquired flat foot or posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. So that would cause uh, increased stresses on the first metatarsal and predispose the patient to have a hallux valgus deformity. Any uh, so if there is a previous second ray amputation, which means that the patient does not have a second ray, so there is always a space uh, in the lateral aspect of the big toe where the toe can deviate. So those patients who have undergone uh, a ray amputation of the second toe, while they have a predisposition to have a hallux valgus deformity as well. Any form of muscle imbalance uh, like in cerebral palsy, that can also risk, uh, lead to uh, a bunion deformity. And as I mentioned, uh, the only extrinsic factor is wearing narrow-toed shoes. So I think the most important thing is the pathogenesis of hallux valgus. How does hallux valgus form or how does it progress? And why is it that it is not just a two-dimensional deformity, but it, it is a deformity which is involved in all the three dimensions? So it is very important to understand that. 
what actually starts the process of hallux valgus pathogenesis well we are not sure and based upon every disease or every pathology it might be different but definitely uh, how it progresses i think the uh, there is a standard way of its progression so i'll just try uh, to explain the pathogenesis and how the deformity progresses so first of all so if we look at the first ray so if we look at the first metatarsal you have sesamoids right underneath it both the medial and the lateral sesamoids which are under the belly of a uh, flexor hallucis brevis medial and lateral heads respectively so sesamoids normally stay in the normal position while if you look at the first ray the first metatarsal head it moves medially and also dorsally so what it leads to is or what you see normally is that the sesamoids are actually positioned laterally with respect to the metatarsal head however the truth is that the sesamoids remain in the same position while the metatarsal head actually moves medially so so that leads to what we call as relative lateral displacement of the sesamoids so as the uh, first metatarsal head has displaced more medially there is an increased pressure or increased stress on the medial capsule and it tends to stretch out and it leads to attenuation of the medial capsule or what we call as mcl rupture so this by itself can sometimes be the first or the predisposing factors for certain patients which leads to the development of hallux valgus deformity so along with the attenuation of the medial capsule uh, what it leads to is it leads to a valgus deformity at the first metatarsal so the first metatarsal starts moving in the outward direction oh, sorry the first proximal phalanx starts moving in the outward direction and this is what causes the hallux valgus now when this happens uh, since the sesamoids are also in the same uh, position the EHL and the AFHL they get inserted to the distal phalanx so the distal phalanx actually is almost in the line with the metatarsal so as a result the pull of EHL and FHL when we compare it to the first metatarsophalangeal joint or to the first metatarsal head it also moves a bit medially and that actually increases the valgus pull uh, for worsening of the hallux valgus deformity and since the medial structures start attenuating and uh, they become lax the lateral structures uh, which is lcl and the lateral capsule and including the adductor tendon or the adductor hallucis tendon they start contracting so it leads to the lateral capsular contracture along with the adductor tendon uh, contraction and the altered pull of the ehl and the fhl this is what in combination leads to worsening of the hallux valgus deformity now apart from that if you look at the abductor hallucis so if this is the big toe abductor hallucis is over here on the lateral side but as the deformity progress which includes the medial deviation of the first metatarsal head and the lateral deviation of the proximal phalanx abductor hallucis starts moving plantarwards so it leads to a plantar and a lateral shift of abductor hallucis and that itself causes a pronation deformity of the big toe so the big toe starts pronating as a result of this the dorsal surface of the big toe starts facing more medially and the plantar surface starts facing more laterally and this is the reason of big toe pronation deformity and that's the main reason why we call that it is actually a three dimensional deformity now apart from that when you know that the do that the first metatarsal head has shifted dorsally so as it has shifted dorsally the ability of the first metatarsal head to bear weight reduces and that leads to defunctioning of the first metatarsal now since the first metatarsal is not bearing weight the weight or the load is transferred to the lesser metatarsals 
and this is what leads to lesser metatarsal GR. And when the hallux valgus is worsened, so if you see that the, when the big toe is pushing, it starts pushing the lesser toe, the second toe, and so it starts occupying the space of the lesser toe. And that itself leads to a secondary deformity of hammer toe in the lesser toes as well. So this is how the whole pathogenesis of hallux valgus and this is how the deformity develops. So we'll have, and as you can see in the whole flow chart, you can see how there is a valgus of P1, the hallux valgus, the pronation and the plantar flexion of the big toe, lesser metatarsalgia and the hammer toe deformity. So now, if you look at this direction and uh, this diagram, so this is another diagram and uh, a respective x-ray as well of a patient. So if you look at the sesamoids, so this is the medial sesamoid and this is the lateral sesamoid. So now if you look at the sesamoids, actually the sesamoids are placed in the normal position, but it is the first metatarsal head which has gone medially. But what we actually see on the x-ray or how we describe it is that the sesamoids have shifted laterally. And if you look at this cross section, which actually shows all the muscles uh, in the big toe. So on the top you have EHB, then you would have, a, obviously you would have EHL on the dorsum and FHL on the plantar surface. And this is the medial head of flexor helicis brevis. And this is the medial sesamoid. This is the lateral head of flexor helicis brevis and this is the lateral sesamoid. This is the medial capsule and this is the lateral capsule. This is abductor helicis and this is adductor helicis. So as the, as the deformity progresses, so you can see that what, what is uh, visible to us is that both the sesamoids and the flexor helicis brevis respective heads, they have actually shifted laterally or there's a relative shift uh, lateral shift of the sesamoids with respect to the first metatarsal. The axis of first metatarsal has changed, which possibly means that there's a component of pronation. Abductor helices has not just come lateral, and for it to come lateral, it comes plantar as well. Adductor helices, it becomes stronger and it starts contracting as well. So now talking about the clinical presentation of the hallux valgus. So the most common presentation of hallux valgus is it presents as a deformity and in many a cases as a painless deformity. It might present as pain. Now where would the pain be? There are multiple areas where it could be painful. The patient can be painful at the bunion, somewhere around at the big toe, at the joint, so this is the first MTB joint. It can be painful at this callosity of the hammer toe or on the plantar surface right across over here where this is on the plantar surface. So where you would have lesser metatarsalgia. So a prominent metatarsal head would be seen on the plantar surface. So it can be painful over there. The pain may become worse on wearing shoes, particularly narrow toed shoes. And these patients would definitely complain that they are not able to wear normal shoes and they prefer to wear, prefer to wear slippers or something which have an open toe box.